Good evening and welcome to our first King's Talk of the new academic year. My name is Greg Hunter, I'm the Deputy Ed Co-Curricular at King's. Tonight we'll be hearing from Dr Nathan Hudson Peacock about his life since leaving King's in 2010 and in particular providing medical support in remote locations and being on the front line in two major London hospitals during the COVID-19 outbreak. I'm also delighted to welcome the OKS careers rep Lizzie Bird who will conduct the initial interview and questions after Nathan's presentation. At that stage, we'll be taking your questions from the audience. Please either type your question into the Q&A function as part of Zoom at any time, or alternatively, put your virtual hand up after the presentation and we can put you live on the air to ask the question yourself. And now it is with great pleasure that I pass you over to Lizzie and Nathan. Lizzie. Thank you very much indeed uh, for the introduction, Greg. And I'd just like to extend a very warm welcome to everybody who's watching this evening. And also a uh, very big thanks to you, Nathan, for joining us. I know there's been a tremendous amount of interest in this talk, and I think we're all very much looking forward to finding out about life as an expedition doctor. Um, I know that you've prepared a presentation for us, which will really bring some of those insights to us through photographs and stories and anecdotes. But it's also a presentation that really uh, illustrates your outlook on the importance of understanding your purpose and how that sort of influenced the decisions that you've made and that have impacted you both professionally and also personally. Um, but before we come on to the presentation, if I may just take you back a little bit in time uh, to your days at King's. So I believe that you left King's around 10 years ago. And for those people who haven't met you before, perhaps you would like to tell us a little bit about your life at the school and some of the activities in which you got involved. Hi, yeah, well, firstly, just thank you so much for inviting me along to uh, talk today. Um, I've done a few talks recently, but I'm feeling incredibly nervous about tonight's one. I think because Kings was such an important part of my life. I started going to Kings at the age of about five or something, started pre-prep and all the way through, never went to any other school. So, um, and embarrassingly, I definitely did cry on my last ever day at school. <laughs> so uh, yeah, feeling, uh, looking forward to tonight. And um, yeah, it was actually just over 10 years ago now that I left. It was in July, 2010 uh, of Kamem, which is absolutely terrifying. And um, we've got no idea where the time has gone. Uh, it feels like just yesterday I was uh, walking around the precincts. Uh, although I, apparently it's quite different at the moment with all the COVID precautions. Uh, but yeah, so I, I was there uh, whole life. I was in Marlowe House, uh, day people um, from 2005 to 2010. Although I actually spent quite a bit of time in trad for my last few weeks of uh, my final year over King's Week because I was involved with the King's Men and the symphony orchestra and the, um, the wind bands and everything, which kept me quite busy rehearsals wise. And often it was actually just a bit easier to um, crash for the night in trad. Very kind of them to put me up. And so, uh, yeah, it's uh, an absolute pleasure to be here tonight. Fantastic. So a significant part of your life, uh, Nathan. But after King's, you went on to study at university at Cambridge, where you studied medicine, which I think we can all agree is, is a subject um, which has a very demanding hours and workload. But outside of academic studies at university, there is always plenty of opportunity for developing personally and sort of for personal growth which is a little bit different from the environment at school where perhaps there's a little bit more structure and a little bit more discipline. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about how you sort of made that change from school to university? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I think medicine, although it's quite difficult, it's actually fortunate in a way in that it is quite structured compared to some, stru uh, some subjects. We have a lot of lectures every day, a lot of um, classes and practical things, which keeps us quite busy. And certainly where, where I was at university, we got set quite a bit of work. So I was often working to deadlines. And then on the side of that, trying to fit in time for choir and playing sport and going out and socializing, um, it meant that actually I, I had quite a, lot, quite a lot of structure, which I think was very fortunate to, for me because I definitely work best to deadlines. Um, and that's a really big change that people have to embrace if you're going, when you're going to university, especially if you're going into an art, an art subject where you might only have say 10 hours of contact time a week and trying to find some way of structuring your day 
And that's something I'm actually just having to learn at the moment. I'm doing a diploma in travel health uh, with a lot of sort of self-study time. And, you know, the first module, I was all over the place, missing deadlines left, right and centre, just because it wasn't wasn't used to, well, there weren't deadlines as such, that was the problem. And um, so, you know, I've learned to get used to self-imposing deadlines, being much more structured with time. And, you know, it's, it's always a learning process. But I think for me in medicine, King's actually prepared me really well, just because there was a similar degree of structure and the opportunity to get involved with all of the extracurricular stuff, which, um, as we all know, there's lots of that at King's. So. <laughs> there is indeed, there is indeed. So, uh, Nathan, let's sort of move the, the clock forward a little bit. And we're now in 2020. And amongst many other things, you are an expedition doctor. And I think we're all very keen to find out more about that. So let me hand over to you for your presentation and we will speak again afterwards. All right, thanks very much. Great, so hopefully you can all uh, see my screen share. And I'm just gonna start with a bit of a story uh, about expedition medicine. And hopefully I'll give you a bit of context as to what life is like as an expedition doctor. So we'll start in the summer of 2018. Uh, this was Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, it's the highest peak in Africa, in the southern, in yeah, in Africa, and it's the highest freestanding mountain in in the world at 5,895 meters. And this was my home with uh, another doctor and a very small team for about three weeks. Uh, it was an amazing time. Uh, we would spend the daytimes uh, screening some participants that were coming up on their way to the summit. So we had six groups of participants. They were mostly university students and they were fundraising for various different charities. So in the morning we would uh, get up, we would some, maybe collect some water from the river nearby, uh, and we would see the group coming up to check if they were all okay, screen them all at the lunchtime to make sure there weren't any problems before they then headed up to summit that evening. And then in the afternoon we would meet a group on the way down, and outside of those times we would see if there were any other problems that we were alerted to by radio that we would then go and Go and sort out. So it'd been quite a busy morning already. Uh, we had one helicopter evacuation. Uh, someone had a terrible. Someone had a really really terrible headaches, which can be a sign of uh, a type of altitude sickness called high altitude cerebral edema, which is where the brain starts to swell and can be a life threatening condition. Thankfully, very very rare. Uh, and in the case of Kilimanjaro, there's really good evacuation options during the daytime. And so we'd had a slightly busy morning already. Uh, and then the afternoon came around and we had the group coming up for uh, their, their medical screening. And the group arrived mostly fine. And then there was one participant who arrived a good hour after the rest of the group. He was slow, he was exhausted. He, he was really struggling. And we sat him down and we had a long chat about whether it was the right thing for him to carry on to push on to the summit. Uh, the thing was, he, was, he, he didn't actually have any, any objective signs or symptoms you know he wasn't coughing his oxygen levels were fine uh, he wasn't out of breath when he was resting he was just struggling to keep up with the group and uh, he was also incredibly determined to continue he'd spent a couple of years fundraising he hadn't been able to go the previous year which was the original plan because of a bereavement and he was absolutely determined to reach the summit Nevertheless, we thought, you know, there's a few problems here. He's, he's not keeping up. You know, it's unlikely he's going to be able to summit. And we had these conversations with him and the rest of the team. But actually, there wasn't any other option. He, it was either go down or carry on. And so we eventually came to the decision to let him continue, but with very close supervision from uh, one of the guides. And so after he came and went, we didn't hear any problems. Uh, heard that he reached base camp without any problems. And we, we headed to bed. And it was a really beautiful, beautiful, clear night. I don't have any pictures from that night, but this is a, a time-lapse video I took in uh, the Zara Valley in India last summer. And I'm not sure if you can see the video playing on your screens, but essentially you can, you can see it was a beautiful night. The, the Milky Way was present. There were shooting stars all over the, the shop. It's amazing what the sky looks like when you are miles away from, from uh, any sort of light pollution and you're high up in, in, the, uh, high up in altitude. And so this was roughly what the night sky looked like that evening. And we settled down for bed, but we were a little bit worried and didn't sleep that well, you know, thinking about this guy, was he going to be okay? You know, when you're at altitude, you don't actually sleep that well anyway. And then two o'clock in the morning came and we got a knock on our tent. And it was the guide that had gone up with the participant. And he said, 
guys, doctors, I'm really, really worried. I think I think participant might have high altitude pulmonary edema or HAPE. And this is a condition where the lungs start to pool with fluid from the lack of oxygen. And actually it's a, it's a condition that can be fatal. And this was something that we were like, oh my goodness, you know, we need to get them off the mountain. But it's a very quickly fatal condition. It can, if, if you don't descend in altitude, you don't give someone the medication or oxygen, it can be fatal in as little as eight hours. And so we knew the clock was ticking. And this guide had already come down from base camp back to our tent because his radio had stopped working. So we knew we'd lost an hour there already. And he'd been with him for an hour. So that was already two hours gone. So he said, okay, well, well, tell us the symptoms. And he said, you know, every time he lies down to sleep, he starts, he starts coughing. And then he seems really out of breath, even when he's sitting there resting in his tent. And he's complaining of a little bit of pain in the chest. And these are some of the classic signs and symptoms of high altitude pulmonary edema. And so we said, well, this is a real emergency. We need to get him down as quickly as we can. Um, here's some medication, take this nifedipine, get back up to base camp as quick as you can, give it to him, put him on oxygen, and then evacuate him and we'll meet you on the way down. So it was about 2.30 in the morning by this point, we grabbed our head torches, grabbed the medical kit, and we set off into the night, moving as quickly as we could. You know, didn't have much time to take in the beautiful stars around us. But then we also couldn't run because of the altitude. So we sort of settled for a slow jog, fast walk sort of thing, trying not to trip over in the night as well. And eventually we got to the point where our path met the path coming down from base camp. And we waited about 10 minutes and there was, there was no sign of anyone there. We were worried, had we missed him? Had, had something gone wrong? And we waited another 20 minutes and 30 minutes and 45 minutes went by before we eventually saw some head torches just in the distance. First, we were thinking if they were stars or something else, but they, were, they got closer and closer. And eventually we realized it, it was the participant. And he got to us and we, we wondered, uh, you know, where, where's his oxygen? We'd said specifically put him on oxygen and he wasn't wearing any. And the guide explained that the oxygen had actually gone with the rest of the group before they'd arrived there uh, up to the summit and leaving no oxygen in the group. And the oxygen in the porter cabin at base camp had, had run out. So here he was, uh, this is what we, we saw. Um, you can see he's on a sort of one wheel suspension stretcher thing there. And it's the, the middle of the night and trying to evacuate him down the side of Mount Kilimanjaro, 5,000 meters in altitude. And it was pretty scary. So he wasn't wearing any oxygen and we were now about five hours into this, into this window, but luckily he'd already lost a couple of hundred meters of altitude thanks to the stretcher and the quick evacuation. Uh, and he'd had the medication as well, so that was good. But for any of you who are familiar with oxygen saturations, uh, we use a, a finger probe that has a small red light that measures the uh, concentration of oxygen in the blood. And at sea level, in a healthy, healthy person, you would expect the oxygen saturation to be above 96%. Someone who's got bad, bad lung disease, you might expect their saturation to be about 90%. And in someone who's got really bad COVID, you might see a saturation of about 80%. And that's when you're getting really worried and thinking about needing high levels of care. So you can imagine how scared we were when we put the oxygen probe on his finger and it said a saturation of 48%. This guy was really sick. So we knew we had to act fast. And so we, we decided in these conditions, head torches on full blast and just to try and get him down as quickly as we could. We sent one of the porters ahead to the next camp called Millennium to grab a bottle of oxygen from there, bring it back up as quickly as he could. And thankfully, this is us at the sunrise. Um, <laughs> oh, it's an amazing view, it brings back some memories. Um, but yeah, this is us at the sunrise and he did absolutely fine, made it, uh, no problems. And the whole team were there to continue helping him on his descent down. And he did really, really well. He got down to uh, the bottom of the park that evening and uh, made an absolute full recovery. Um, but it was thanks to the teamwork of this entire amazing group of people and the ability to evacuate him quickly uh, that meant that he survived. And that was my first uh, real emergency as an expedition doctor a few years ago now. And since uh, that time, I've had the amazing pleasure of traveling the world um, all over from mountains to deserts to jungle and it's been this incredible uh, career where I've been able to uh, work part-time for the NHS and part-time as an expedition doctor. Um, but you've just seen, heard a really sort of emotive emergency story 
But actually the reality is that expedition medicine isn't like that most of the time. That's the kind of stuff we have to prepare for. But most of what we do is around risk management and preparation and actually dealing with a lot of feet, like so many blisters. Um, and so that, that's what my life's been for the, the last couple of years, part-time NHS, part-time expedition medicine. And the amazing thing is that I didn't even know expedition medicine existed three years ago. I'd never been up a mountain. The only time I'd ever camped was at festival. So, you know, it's amazing that when you start looking for opportunities and knocking on doors, it's amazing what sort of opportunities arise once you're curious and you just follow your, follow your curiosity. So my journey then took me into the Indian Himalayas where I was working on a Barclays trip. Uh, and it was with a company called Just Challenge and they take big corporate groups on um, adventurous treks and in doing so raise money for uh, charitable causes. So this trip raised over 150,000 pounds for uh, a mental health charity. Um, and there are a couple of ambassadors on this trip, one of which was called Kenton Cool. And he is a chap who is one of the world's most highly acclaimed high altitude mountain guides. He summited Everest 14 times. He took Victoria Pendleton, Ben Fogel, so ran off lines up there. And he was on this trip. And um, me being me at the time had no idea who he was. So we just got chatting and I had no idea who he was until about halfway through when someone was like, you know who this guy is, right? And I was like, no, never heard of him. And he had quite a limp, which I thought was, which was interesting. So when they said he summited Everest 14 times, I was like, what? But he's limping, how, how is that possible? And um, it turned out he'd actually broken both of his heel bones in a climbing accident 20 years before and ended up in a wheelchair for almost a year. And they then put his mind to it and thought, no, I'm not going to let this injury be the end of me. And proceeded to then climb Everest 14 times and become one of the most uh, famous mountain guides in the world. But anyway, we, we, became, we became friends and um, stayed in touch. And then uh, this January, so earlier this year, I ended up in Ecuador working for Kenton Cool. Um, as part of the high altitude preparation for his client who was due to be climbing Everest this May, which unfortunately got cancelled because of coronavirus. So we're climbing up uh, Cotopaxi Volcano, just in the distance on the right side of the screen, you can just about make another mountain peak out in the distance, and that is Chimborazo, and that's actually the highest point on the planet. It's not as high above sea level as Mount Everest, but because of the way the Earth's crust is thicker in the middle, the top of that mountain you see in the distance is actually the closest point on earth to space and we did try and climb that mountain but unfortunately the weather meant we had to turn back uh, so a few other trips uh, cambodia had this incredible uh, time trekking through the jungle going into remote village communities um, and actually seeing what an amazing life these people live despite the fact that so recently in their history they've survived one of the worst genocides in history under the pol pot regime in the khmer rouge and there's so much happiness there despite all of this. And it was a real privilege to be able to, to see some of these communities and the way they live. Had a trek through the Sahara Desert into Mount Everest Base Camp. Uh, if anyone's wondering, this is an absolutely fantastic trek. It's very accessible. Uh, one of the girls in my year, uh, her parents just did the Everest Base Camp trek last year. So open to young people, parents and grandparents alike. Um, and then Last summer, I found myself in northern Pakistan uh, en route to K2 base camp. Uh, it's a very remote trek. Had about three weeks, uh, three weeks without any internet. Um, all of the stuff that we needed for the expedition had to come with us. All of the food, all of the supplies. We could gather water en route, um, but everything else had to come with us. So we had quite a team of porters and guys to help look after us. And as part of this expedition, we, we spent the night at Broad Peak base camp. And this is the mountain you see just behind the clouds on this picture here. And this is a photo I took um, on the evening before a group of climbers went to embark on their summit attempt to Broad Peak. And Broad Peak's one of the 14 mountains in the world that's above 8,000 meters. And very luckily, the Swiss expedition invited our group in to have dinner with them just before they set off on their summit uh, attempt. And we were delighted. We said, yes, of course, we'll have dinner with you guys. And Amazing. I don't know if any of you have seen the film Everest. Um, there's a few characters in there, um, two of which were having dinner with us that night. I don't mean the actors in the film. I mean the, the characters that the film was based on. And two of us were in that tent having dinner with us that night before they went on to uh, successfully summit uh, Broad Peak. And the oldest in their group was actually 72. So um, very impressive. 
And then last summer, uh, I had five weeks in India with British Exploring Society, which do fantastic trips for 16 to 24 year olds uh, to remote places, learning survival skills, independence and leadership um, in places within the UK and also further afield in the Amazon, India and uh, the Yukon. It's a, a fantastic trip. And again, we had beautifully, beautifully clear skies, as you can see here. And I don't know if you can make out the shooting star just on the right of the word India there. So fast forward to 2020, sorry, it's quite bright. Fast forward to 2020, I was meant to be off to Jordan into the desert uh, on a trek to the Wadi Rum, uh, through the Wadi Rum desert to Petra. But then COVID-19 happened. And my Instagram, instead of being photos of mountains and pretty places like that, rapidly turned into selfies of me behind a mask, wearing a shield and photos from behind the front line. So I just want to play this very short video um, to hopefully give you some context of what it was like on the front line. This is the front line in the war. Apart from two patients, every patient we're looking after has got COVID. We can't cope with a big spike. We just can't. Every day, some battles are won. This is one of the doctors here. And some are lost. All the patients here are critically ill. So this was a video clip taken from a BBC News um, a video in April this year. It was filmed inside UCLH and speaking there was my consultant at the time, Jim Down. And he was saying that, you know, this is nothing like we've seen before. And, and it was true, you, you, you could see that some people, some people were dying on a daily basis there. Um, and it's true, there were many, many difficulties that were faced um, by myself and, and everyone during this time. Um, you know, facing death on a daily basis, we had long shifts and stuffy PPE. Um, and we had lots of phone calls to relatives saying, you know, I'm so sorry, despite everything, they, they didn't make it. But as well as that, there were some real positives. Uh, there was so much teamwork, so much camaraderie. We had so much support from the nation, like those Thursday 8 p.m. claps, I can't tell you how much they actually made a difference. And seeing signs on the bus signs and in Piccadilly Square, all of these things made a real difference. And all of the free food, honestly, absolutely brilliant. The free food was amazing. So it actually was difficult, but there was a lot of positives. And in a way, it was almost easier for us in the hospital because we could go about life as normal you know we could go to work we can see people we can go about our jobs and it's a bit different and a bit more difficult than usual but it's still quite familiar so actually the the real difficulty came in in march when i developed a cough and um we weren't testing at the time so i don't know if it was covid19 or not but uh, i had a cough and so i had to stay at home to self-isolate um and that's when I noticed that things got difficult. So I had to isolate for, for two weeks and then there was a change in the rotor, which meant I actually had another week off. So I was at home by myself for three weeks and I was totally disconnected in a way that I'd never been before. Even on expedition, I'd been with people. Um, but I was totally disconnected from sort of reality, but at the same time, more connected than ever through the internet and through social media. And suddenly while I was sat there at home, not seeing patients and not going to work, I became so aware of all of the issues that are surrounding the, the pandemic. You know, there was too little PPE. And so I was trying to sort out PPE donations through social media. And then I was aware that actually there was too much PPE causing environmental damage. You know, just in UCLH alone, in one day, we'd be using 22 and a half thousand single use plastic aprons, 22 and a half thousand every single day that were going to landfill. And so this became a problem. And I was speaking to plastic companies that are, you know, produce biodegradable plastic alternatives. And then there were, um, you know, news articles of people not wearing their masks properly, people not knowing how to wash their hands correctly. And so I, and I kind of took a lot of these problems on myself and started feeling quite overwhelmed and stressed about it all. And it was at this point that I decided to reach out to our uh, mental health support line at work, just for a bit of advice. Uh, I'm not used to feeling stressed and overwhelmed. I'm usually sort of pretty easy, easy going, happy go lucky. So it was quite an unfamiliar feeling uh, to me that I only sort of remembered from a couple of weeks before exams and various stages of uh, school and university. But anyway, I, I spoke to the, the mental health support uh, person and she just asked me three questions. Uh, she said, what are you doing 
uh, to look after your exercise? Are you exercising every day? What are you doing in terms of your sleep pattern? And importantly, what are you doing to relax without exposure to the internet? And it was these three questions that really st stuck with me. And, and it's true, there's been so many studies that have linked physical health and mental health. And if we fail to look after our physical health by exercising and by sleeping properly, then it's no wonder that our mental health can take a toll. Uh, take a, take a toll. There's a fantastic book called Why We Sleep, which if you haven't read it, I, I would totally recommend reading. Um, and so the next few days I thought, okay, right, I need to pull myself together, work on my sleep and my exercise. I started exercising every day. I was getting myself into a better sleep habit and started to feel much, much better. But then I thought, you know, what about this whole internet thing? And I thought I would tackle this because, you know, it's something that we get told as, a, as the younger generation. Um, although I, I was with some uh, people the other day who very kindly pointed out that I'm not the young generation anymore. I'm a millennial rather than a Gen Z. But anyway, I'm counting myself as part of the younger generation here. And we always get told that the internet is bad and we need to disconnect. Um, and so I started thinking about it. And, and actually, I thought back to what are the moments where I've been happiest in the last few years? And there were two moments that really, really stood out for me. One was on Mount Kilimanjaro for three weeks, where my sleep cycle was completely in tune with, with sunrise and sunset. We would go to bed when it got dark, we'd get up when it got light. And I was exercising every day and I was completely disconnected from the internet. Um, and the other time that really stood out for me, it, it's, it's crazy, um, was actually hand washing some clothes uh, in India last summer. <laughs> And in case you're wondering, I didn't have a man bun this time last year. That's actually one of the other doctors on the trip. Um, but there was a, a very familiar scene, you know, maybe the next day or something, where I was washing my clothes, having collected some water from the river and sterilized it. And I was the only one at our little base camp, just by myself, just hand washing some clothes. And genuinely felt really, really happy. And I was thinking, you know, what is the difference between that environment and the environment I found myself in when I was isolating at home? And actually, the, the, the difference really was obviously the environment surrounding, but it's this state of being permanently connected to the internet. And I spoke to Ken Cool, the mountaineer I mentioned, and I spoke to Tim Mosdale, another um, mountaineer who I was in Ecuador with. And I said, what is it about expeditions that keeps you coming back year after year? And they both said independently that it's like when you're on an expedition, you enter this magical world where reality kind of, is suspended for a bit and you just live in the in the moment as cliched as that is um and but you are really just there and all of the daily stresses sort of fade away because you you can't access them you don't have the internet and this was exactly what i what i felt and so i thought okay i i'm gonna try this whole you know reducing my internet time so i said i'm not gonna use my phone in bed i'm not gonna use my phone for the first three hours of every morning i'm not gonna use the phone or computer or anything uh for, for my last hour before bed i did that and um, felt immediately better. Uh, just took a couple of days and I already started to feel better. And then I thought, well, what about doing something a bit more adventurous and you know, actually going out for a walk from time to time or going out um, you know, to do my exercise without my phone and started leaving my phone at home from time to time and found it was very refreshing. And it's this funny, it's this funny situation when you venture out without your phone or something and, and you find yourself sort of reaching into your pocket as if to try and grab it, even though it's not even there. And you realize you've got these habits so, so ingrained in you that it's almost like you're codependent. Um, and so it's interesting because it, it got me thinking about, you know, why is the internet a problem? Because it's so phenomenal, the internet. You know, everyone can agree that it's absolutely changed the world. It is this amazing entity that allows so much possibility. And so I started thinking about, you know, what is the thing that's going on here? And the reason is because as humans, when we're exposed to problems, there's two potential outcomes. We can either have a reaction, which is where we say, you know, oh, that's such a shame. You know, what a, you know, what a disaster. Or there's an action where we can actually do something about it. And as an individual on an expedition, if you come across a problem, for example, a headache or, um, you know, some blisters or bad weather or your, your, one of your expedition participants has a broken tent, you can either say, oh, what a shame, or you can do something about it. And it's human nature to want to help people. And so if someone's got a problem with their tent, you don't just sit there and watch them and do nothing about it. You go over there and help them with, with their tent and you would help solve the problem. And that's the reality of being on an expedition. But the trouble is once you're connected to the internet, 
suddenly you're aware of all the problems that aren't immediately relevant to you. So when you're on an expedition, you, you, you know, you, you only know about what's immediately in front of you and you can only do what you can do with the things around you. With the internet, you then are, become aware of all the global issues, you know, climate change, plastic pollution, racial injustice, the, the list is endless. And it's not just the awareness of the issue, it's actually the ability to do something about it. And in the same way that if you're there on an expedition and your buddy is a problem with their tent and you want to help them, when you learn about things like, uh, you know, the global issues, you want to do something about it. We're morally obliged to as, as human beings. We want to help our fellow, um, our fellow species on this planet. And so this is the, the situation we find ourselves in. And this is why the internet is such an amazing tool and why it's such a great thing is because more than ever before, people are aware of the problems that are facing our planet. People are able to do something about it. And, you know, look at all the rallies recently for George Floyd and for um, Extinction Rebellion, again, you know, for, for all these different causes. It's absolutely fantastic. But there comes a point as well where actually the ability to do something about it means we all feel morally obliged to do something about it. And so as an individual, we end up kind of taking the weight of the world and putting it on our own shoulders. And that was exactly what I'd done while I was locking down in COVID-19. I was aware of PPE issues, sustainability issues, mask issues, everything. And I was sort of taking it on my own responsibility to, to try and do something about it because I was connected to the internet all the time. And just taking those few hours each day to disconnect really allowed me to reconnect with actually what was going on around me and the things that were important to me. And there's obviously a lot around, um, a lot of conversations around this topic at the moment, especially with the George Floyd protests recently. And there's been people who are saying, you know, white silence is violence. And it's, it's a dangerous uh, rhetoric to be using because it essentially polarizes it. You're either with us or you're against us. Whereas actually people can be fighting their own silent battles. And sometimes um, that's not a very helpful way of looking at things. And it isn't the responsibility of every single individual to try and tackle every single problem in the world, because that means no one becomes an expert in any one thing. So in the same way as that our parents' generation before internet, if they heard about you know, racism or plastic waste or climate change on the news, they think, oh, man, that's really terrible. I better reduce my plastic waste. But it's not something that they took on their own responsibility to organize protests and put content out there because they couldn't. It wasn't an option that was available to them. And so basically it, it comes down to thinking with these problems that am I the right person for the job? And it might be that you are, and you know, you might have thousands of followers on, on Instagram or Twitter or whatever, and you can put out content out there and it's doing a really great thing in the world. But bearing in mind that the algorithms built into social media inherently mean that the people who are viewing your content will probably be people who already share the same opinion as you, because that's the way social media is designed to work. It shows you more of what you want to see. It doesn't show you things that contradict your own view. And so you need to think, is this the right time for me to be um, supporting this message? And am I the right person for it? And the answer might be yes, in which case the internet is absolutely fantastic. But remembering to disconnect allows us to gain some perspective and think about it. And actually, if you are super passionate about reducing plastic waste, then yes, exams might feel completely pointless at one particular point in time when there's so much bigger problems in the world. But actually, if you just get your head down, work really hard and get good grades, go to a good university and then become the prime minister, then you can do whatever the hell you want. You can ban all plastics and everything. So it's good to be able to disconnect from time to time to just gain that sense of perspective and really uh, ensure the actions we're taking are done consciously. So I've spoken quite a bit about expedition medicine. I've spoken a bit about what life was like on the front line in COVID-19 and a bit about the difficulties I've faced. Um, and hopefully I've left you with a few thoughts so that if ever life feels a little bit like this, a bit of an uphill struggle towards the summit of Mount Tupcal in, in Morocco, which is the highest peak in North Africa, then you can just ask yourself three simple questions. Am I exercising? Am I sleeping enough? And am I remembering to disconnect from time to time? Thank you very much. And back to Lizzie. Nathan, thank you very much indeed. I think that that was an extraordinary emotional roller coaster of sort mm. of awe inspiring photographs taking us around the world. Um, and then, really, to the harsh reality of the last few months and dealing with COVID 19 in hospitals here um, and sort of everything in between. So, thank you very much indeed.
Wow. Um, there have been a number of questions that have come in and I've got some questions as well, so I'll sort of um, manage those if that's okay. Yeah. But I think something that has really come about and it comes through in a couple of questions is a fascination as to how you got into this world um, of being an expedition doctor. I think you mentioned you didn't really know about it until three years ago. Yeah. Tell us about how you found yourself in this particular niche. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting actually because um... As you say, I didn't know that expedition medicine existed uh, at all. When I uh, started university, I really wanted to become a surgeon. Um, I was set on becoming a surgeon and you know, that was my interest. And then when I got to clinical school, we had this talk on electives and I realized that there was such a specialty as pre-hospital emergency medicine um, with uh, where you get to go out on a helicopter and save lives and things like this. And I was like, wow, okay, I want to do emergency medicine and started focusing on, on that and doing electives with the air ambulance. And then um, essentially I got through to my second year as a doctor, still not knowing that expedition medicine existed. And it boiled down to the fact that I actually really wanted to go skiing. Um, I go skiing pretty much every year. And just the way the rotors had worked out meant I wasn't going to get enough annual leave to go skiing um, for the second year in a row. And I thought, right, I've had enough of this. Um, I don't want to not go skiing again. So I was looking for uh, essentially medical conferences and ski resorts. So I was, you know, it's the power of the internet. You can find this kind of thing. Um, and so I found a, a medical conference in a ski resort and thought, excellent, I can use some study leave for this. Um, and it was, a, it was a conference on expedition medicine. And I was like, sounds interesting. So I went along to it and my mind was blown. Like I was exposed to this world that I didn't know existed. And so I suspended all of my other ambitions and put that all to one side and thought, you know, I've got plenty of years ahead. I can always come back to that, but I'm just going to throw myself at this opportunity that's come about and then basically just put all my efforts into that. So I started sending off millions of emails, doing the courses I needed to do, phoning up different companies, you know, the power of actually getting on the phone and speaking to people, um, I think has, has been absolutely crucial over the last few years for me, just, you know, never being scared to reach out to someone, even if it's just a message on Instagram or an email or whatever, or pick up the phone, just reaching out to people and connecting and just exploring what opportunities are out there. And I went on that Kilimanjaro trip you heard about and thought, this is amazing. I want to do this forever. And yeah, here, here we are now. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you very much. How lovely to bring together various different passions of yours uh, in, in one area. Um, I'm also very conscious, we spoke a little bit before about your time at King's, but, but not really that impact that it's had on you. So tell us a bit how King's has really prepared you for your career. Um, I think it's, it's just in so many ways. Um, you know, King's was really, for me and for many others, uh, it was of such a healthy environment to grow up in, uh, where uh, succeeding in something is, is celebrated. I remember as a shell arriving she is in 2005 which is absolutely terrifying um and and we heard the the king's men singing and the, and i remember thinking like wow that's really really cool whereas mm -hmm. if you had that at some other schools it might be you know cause for bullying and you know ridicule but i feel like king's is actually a really supportive environment and whether it's art or music or academia whatever you are passionate about mm -hmm. there is an avenue for you to pursue that passion um whether it's through the thursday afternoon activities i don't know if you guys still do that those things um uh, and you want to go sailing or join CCF or, you know, try your hand out of scuba diving. I don't know if Kings has got a group for that yet, but they, maybe they should in the future. But whatever you want to do, though, King, Kings will support that. And, and actually, one of the avenues specifically on that vein for me was in 6B, I fancied my hand at a bit of photography. And so I joined the Photography AS off timetable um, thing. Funnily enough, I think it was actually so I didn't have to go and play uh, rugby in the cold because uh, I, I apparently didn't like cold back then, even though I quite like it now. Um, and so I joined the photography AS off timetable thing, and that's where I learned the, the basics of using a camera. I didn't actually do the AS in, in the end. Um, but, you know, I learned the basics of using a DSLR, and we, I remember we had a photography trip up to London and learning some uh, tricks with the camera there. And, um, you know, that's what's given me the ability to then, you know, carry on with photography on all the expeditions. So, yeah, Kings has, you know, prepared me in so many ways. Fantastic. And some beautiful photographs. So thank you very much indeed for those, Nathan. Um, very quick question about being a, an expedition uh, doctor. Are, th are these charity expeditions or do you actually get paid to do this? It's a very, very good question. Um, there's, a, there's a real variety. So most of the ones I've worked on so far have been uh, charitable treks. So I get my expenses all covered. Um, so I don't pay anything, anything to go. Uh, I go along but don't get paid. 
Um, a couple of them have just been adventure treks, so they're not actually raising money for a charity. They're people who are essentially doing um, an adventurous mission, as it were. Um, and again, I've had expenses covered. Uh, when I was working for Kenton in Ecuador, I was getting paid for that. Um, but really, these expeditions I, I see very much as a stepping stone into the rest of uh, my career. You know, I've only been doing this for a couple of years. I've been doing the the low hanging fruit, as it were. But there are there are so many expeditions out there. Working, for example, for for NASA, for the um, British Antarctic Survey, for the Zoological Society of London, where you join research trips and um, you go on these these expeditions, for example, to the British Indian Ocean Island Territory or to Northeast Greenland, which aren't actually available to the public uh, to be part of these research expeditions where you get you get paid. Um, and so that there are so many different opportunities and that, that's only the sort of expedition side. And then there's all of the rest of it, like uh, the humanitarian medicine, which I'll probably go into in, in due course, um, which is more voluntary and you, you don't actually get anything covered. You, you have to cover your own expenses. Uh, so yeah, it's a real, it's a real variety. Um, you would very much struggle to earn a living just doing expedition medicine, but then you couldn't just be an expedition medic without doing some sort of hospital-based work anyway, because you would quickly de-skill. You know, emergencies are thankfully the the um, exception rather than the rule on expedition, and so you need to be dealing with these kinds of things on a daily basis to keep your skills up, which you wouldn't get if all you did was expeditions. There's been a, a lot of a lot of questions about this. Clearly, it's really piqued a, a lot of interest. Um, a question from Hannah is, what do you think really differentiated you from other candidates that help you get selected for these expeditions, um, so other than your photography skills? Uh, do you have any qualifications like mountaineering? Um, so it's 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 an interesting one. So I, I actually hasn't, wasn't doing any photography when I went on my first uh, couple of expeditions. So the, the photos from the desert were actually all taken on my uh, iPhone. Um, so uh, the I think the thing that stood out was actually I had a lot of relevant skills in the, the right places because of my interest in um, pre-hospital emergency medicine at medical school. I founded the Emergency Medicine Society at university, I'd done a couple of electives with the air ambulance and I'd done an emergency medicine elective uh, as a medical student in Tanzania. And then I also, when I was a junior doctor, had rotations through A&E and general practice, which sort of give you the skills necessary for expedition medicine. But then also once I discovered expedition medicine was a thing, I wanted to make sure I had the skills that I needed. And so I started doing event medicine and volunteering at uh, events such as Tough Mudder, um, ultra marathons, uh, European championship games up in Glasgow, uh, lots of different events to sort of skill up on things like blister management, which we wouldn't do in a hospital. And then it was a case of just contacting enough companies over and over again. There are a couple of different courses that I'd done um, and essentially choosing an expedition that was uh, suitable for my skill set. Um, and also, you know, I got rejected from a whole bunch of stuff before I eventually, eventually got my first expedition. But I think it was just that persistence and the fact that before that, I just, you know, got engaged with the things I was actually interested in, which then happened to be relevant later on. Thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm very conscious that sort of the, the whole concept of, of expeditions for people can be really often very life changing experiences. Um, and clearly you've been on several now. <laughs> I know that in your talk, you, you sort of talked about the phone and the internet and some of the impact and sort of reflections that you've had on that as a consequence of actually quite recent events. Mm. But thinking about your ex expeditions, how have they changed your perspectives and frankly, just your day-to-day -day life? Um, I think probably the biggest change that I would say is relevant in my literally everyday life is just being a bit more conscious about the decisions I make where uh, both in terms of things like plastic waste um, recycling but also in terms of actually what I eat so we we know that the meat industry is a bigger contributor to um, pollution and climate change than the entire transport industry combined so that's boats planes freight passenger everything combined is not as much as the meat industry and uh there, was, there were a couple of things on expedition that actually made me really think about this because i knew about this before um as i'm sure we all do uh but it was a it was a, a couple of rather bizarre um situations but one in the sahara desert where it rained really heavily one night and overnight this enormous river probably about twice the width of the thames had appeared in like literally just over the sand dune 
and uh, it was apparently the first time this river had flowed in about seven years. And we woke up at, uh, for breakfast and we heard this bizarre sound, which genuinely sounded like something out of Jurassic Park. And um, we, myself and one of the other participants went over to have a look and it was this herd of camels. Is it a herd? I don't know. Anyway, um, maybe a caravan of camels. Um, <laughs> sounds right, they, yes. They'd all accumulated by the river. And, and I mean, more than 50 camels had all accumulated by the river to have a drink. And this was such a bizarre sight. Like you never see camels in on mass. And for some reason, my mind just linked that with, you know, why is it okay that we are, you know, why do we accept seeing cows like that or chickens or pigs? And, you know, to see camels like that is so weird. So that, that was one um, experience. And the other one was in Pakistan where we went so remotely that we had to take all our food with us. And we had a small flock of chickens that came with us and their number slowly dwindled over the week. And then we had a goat and the, you know, each night we would feed the leftovers to the goat. And then the, the night came where we ate the goat and there was, um, there was a plate of liver and like no one really liked it. And there was some leftovers and one of the people was all Irish. They were like, Oh, it's fine. We'll just, you know, give it to the goat. And the other one was like, that is the goat. And there was sort of this moment of realization where we're like, Oh my God. And you know, our little travel buddy for the last few weeks. And then um, all of the locals, you know, as well, it was very much Western privilege. We were getting this, this meat. None of the local team were, they were all eating vegetarian. And then when we crossed the Gondogorola, which is a high altitude mountain pass, they have this local tradition where they celebrate by eating goat. And so we got over the other side and we, um, we, we bought a goat from a local goat farmer. They sacrificed the goat that night, had a massive celebration. It was this huge sort of special event um, that was celebrated by eating meat, essentially to say thank you to the mountains for their safe passage. And I think it was those two moments that made me realize that actually, like we don't all have to become plant-based to do some good you know, we, it's fine to just eat meat less. And so I've kind of adopted that as my own way now. So I eat meat maybe every, every couple of months on special occasions. And if you imagine if there's say, what, a hundred people on this talk tonight, if you asked everyone to become a vegan, maybe one person would do it, maybe none. But if you said to everyone on this talk, actually, if you eat meat seven days a week, actually just eat meat every other day, you've essentially then gone and created 50 vegans. So I realized that it wasn't a, an all or nothing concept. You know, we can, just reduce and so i think that's probably had the biggest impact on my everyday life sorry that was a bit long-winded um yeah. but i guess it's my everyday life because i don't eat meat all the time anymore so very, very much yeah. a very good answer a very good answer nathan um somebody has has done some research into you and is aware that you're a fellow of the royal geographical society so quick question on that one uh, do you apply for that yourself or did you get nominated for it um sort of a it's a bit of a mix so i had a a uh, friend who's also an expedition doctor, uh, well, a friend, someone I'd met through Instagram actually during lockdown, he was an expedition doctor and we got chatting and we have actually now met in person. Um, but he was a fellow of the Real Royal Geographical Society and he asked if I'd considered, considered it. And I said, uh, no, I don't really know much about it. And then he emailed uh, Shane Windsor, who is in charge of uh, the fellows there, who essentially he, he copied me in on the email and then she got back to me and said, oh, Nathan, I've been following what you've been up to on, on Instagram and I've been meaning to reach out to you and um, it'd be great to have you. So she then proposed me and then um, it was, sec uh, so you have to have a, a nominator at, or a nomin, yeah, someone who nominates you and then someone who seconds it. And the person who's in charge of British Exploring Society who I'd been to India with uh, was happy to second it. And so I got uh, made a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society just a, a few months ago. Congratulations. I'm very conscious that I haven't seen a hand up yet. I am, I am checking, but if anybody wants to, to ask a question of Nathan directly, please do put your hand up and we will, we will make sure that happens. Um, but Nathan, there, there's a lovely question about your career highlights so far. Um, so what would you say that that has been? A difficult one. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, gosh, I don't know where to start. There have been so many highlights. Um, I think some of the, the real highlights, to be honest, have um, just been the, the participants on some of these expeditions and seeing the difference in how they are at the start and the end of an expedition. So a lot, a lot of people who come on these trips are doing it for um, a particular reason, whether they're trying to escape from something at home or whether they've had a loss that's made them rethink, you know, their approach to life and make them want to, you know, take advantage of all the opportunities that her life has to offer. Um, and, and some people are sort of just challenging themselves and, and you can really see some transformations in people over the, over these weeks. And I remember there was one uh, guy who I had on 
Everest Base Camp, who was really nervous at the start because he'd he'd previously a couple of years before that had you know horrendous uh, colorectal cancer and had a massive operation to remove basically all of his insides and had a double stoma, so all of his number ones and twos comes out in a bag on on his abdomen, and you know he was really quite scared of doing the whole the whole thing, and then he made it through the whole trip no problems, and he was so confident and you know so proud of himself at the end of this trip. And there's just been countless stories like that, just seeing people really, um, you know, develop the confidence and yeah, just, just have a really good time really. <laughs> so yeah, so that, that has to be one highlight that comes to mind, but there are many. I'm sure, Nathan, thank you. I'm very conscious that there have been a number of questions which I have not been ignoring by any stretch of the imagination, which uh, clearly indicate there are a lot of people who are thinking about studying medicine <laughs> who are listening at this point Nathan so um, have you got any advice to anybody who is thinking of of looking at medicine uh, to, to offer them yeah I think medicine um, has probably got a lot of bad press in the last few years with the genie doctor strikes and the long hours and all of that kind of thing um, but I think you know it's it's an absolutely incredible career and one of the difficulties with medicine is the, the long hours and the rigidity when it comes to training. But a lot of that is changing. Um, so te uh, 10 years ago, um, uh, more than 90% of foundation doctors went straight into training, whereas now that number sits at around 30%. And that's because many, many more doctors are taking a bit of time out between foundation program and going into a training program to do the kind of things that I'm doing or going to Australia or you know, taking part in research projects. And um, actually, as a, as a doctor in your in your 20s you have this amazing sort of combination of guaranteed job security like you are not going to be out of a job and generally it being like really well paid um if you are just sort of working lo as a locum and then if you're going into training programs there's a lot more flexibility and over the next few years that's going to increase there's a lot of work being done looking into how they can make training programs more acceptable and so I think, you know, being a, being a doctor is an absolutely fantastic career. And if you're thinking about it, then go for it. And it, it can incorporate any interest. You know, if you want to be a radiologist looking at computers all day or being a mountaineer or, you know, being a surgeon or flying around in helicopters, there, there's, there's something for everybody within, within medicine. So I would, I would encourage, it's not for everyone. It's got its difficulties, of course. Um, so do go in with your eyes open, try and get some work experience. Um, but I've had a fantastic time as a, as a medic so far. That's coming across very clearly. A very practical question. What A-levels did you do? What A-levels did I do? Um, I did maths, further maths, biology, physics, chemistry and music. <laughs> <laughs> okay, a long list. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm very conscious that we've got just a few minutes left, but there is just one question that I'd like to, to ask yeah. you about. Um, balancing that role between the NHS part-time and also being an expedition doctor and how you plan that and schedule it with, um, with all the contracts and, and organization. Yeah, it's, uh, it's difficult for sure. You can sort of make a choice whether to go down the conventional route of getting on a training program and um, you know, being a little bit more limited in terms of your flexibility, or you can choose not to go down a training program and kind of do a bit of a build your own career pathway type thing which definitely takes um, a, a bit of bravery to do that. And it's definitely not something for everyone, but it's something that is, is, has worked for me for the last couple of years. But I am thinking of getting back onto a training program, but doing it part-time. Um, but as I say, things are changing. Training programs are becoming more flexible as well. So, so now the emergency medicine training program, which is what I'm thinking of doing, that you can go less than full-time, uh, no questions asked. So uh, that's probably what I'm thinking about, about doing next. Fantastic. Um, I, can, I can see that Greg's come back, come back on the scene, so I appreciate the time is drawing to a close. But a couple of, just uh, two more questions. One, I think it would be very straightforward. The name of the book that you mentioned about sleep. Somebody's just oh, asked for that one again. Why we sleep. <laughs> okay, thank you very much indeed. And I think the final question from my perspective is, what's next for you, Nathan? What's next? Um, who knows? Uh, so many, I've got so many plans. Hope, hopefully uh, going to Antarctica in February and then the Peru and Jordan expeditions that I had lined up for this year have been postponed for a year and uh, hoping to do two months of diving out in Raja Ampat as well. Um, so those are the next sort of things on the cards but who knows what will happen with Covid. Uh, the next thing sort of I guess in my expedition medicine calendar is I'll be uh, chairing a discussion with at the World Extreme Medicine Conference 
which is open to everyone. It's a virtual conference in October. We'll be chairing a discussion on environmental, en environmental concerns and sustainability and travel, um, which is something no one's asked me about yet, which is interesting, because uh, flying all over the world, you might say it's a bad thing. But if you want to hear more about that, come along to the uh, World Extreme Medicine Conference. <laughs> Nathan, thank you very much. Just a couple of, of uh, words from me. Firstly, to say thank you for everybody who submitted questions. I do appreciate that there are about four that have gone um, unanswered um, because they have been unasked, but I hope that we've covered uh, much of the ground uh, already. Um, and Nathan, just to say thank you very much indeed for you. It has been an extraordinary educational, humorous, candid uh, presentation. Your photographs have been absolutely superb. So. Very best of luck in the next chapter, whatever that ends up being. And I do hope that you will come back through the OKS network and do another talk to tell us whatever it, it turns out to be. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And, and just on those note of the questions, if anyone does have any questions unanswered, then I'm more than happy if you just drop me a message on, on Instagram um, or you can get my email address through, through the, uh, the OKS network. That's absolutely fine. I'm more than happy to be contacted. Thank you, Nathan. I think, Greg, we will hand back to you. Wow, thanks. Thanks very much, Lizzie. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, what a fantastic talk. A superb set of questions. It was just wonderful to hear of uh, stories of Mount Kilimanjaro. I love the time lapse video from India, the Himalayas, Cambodia. Nathan, I have a question. What camera do you use to take such wonderful uh, footage and pictures? So here's a little uh, little bit of insider knowledge, I guess. It's part, partly the camera, uh, partly it's uh, the editing process. So I use Lightroom um, and Lightroom Mobile. It's a free app, fantastic for turning what looks like sort of a fairly average photo into one that looks really good. Um, I started my initial expeditions just using my phone and uh, then I realized that my, you know, it just wasn't cutting chase. And I've been using a, a, a was it a Nikon D750? Uh, for recent expeditions. So I actually was using a, a crop frame DSLR before that, but it wasn't getting enough uh, sensitivity for the nighttime shots. So I upgraded myself to a full frame DSLR um, with a very wide angle, uh, well, wide aperture lens on it. Uh, so yeah, D750, great camera. And actually on that note, a good tripod is very useful. There's one called the Ultrapod 2, which is about this big, weighs like 30 grams. I'm not getting paid by them, I wish. Uh, but it's absolutely great bit of kit. <laughs> Fan absolutely fantastic. I, I think there's a, a career change at some stage there uh, with, with all your wonderful pictures in, uh, of uh, various areas in the world. Um, look, I just want to summarise by saying most importantly, you touched on issues of happiness, being fulfilled, being a human, and the absolute importance of switching off technology. A massive thank you to both Nathan and Lizzie for their time and inspiring us to explore the beyond and taking care of yourself all in one. It has been truly memorable. Our next King's Talk is on Wednesday the 7th of October, where we're delighted to welcome Paddy Lofman to provide his insights on climate change and the, the Extinction Rebellion movement. Until then, thank you so much for joining us. Once again, thank you, Nathan. Thank you, Lizzie, and have a good evening.